Chuck, host of Wine Library TV, a.k.a. WLTV, the number one wine show on the internet. And this is BBQ Center. From my heart and from my hand, why don't people understand my intention? Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Fine, how's it going? (laughs) You have a great show, I'm a big fan. So what what, what seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in in the crackle. Charbono, it's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish, what? He ate 54 wieners. Listen, Lavernius, shake face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seeds. <laughs> you could use it to fight off creeping marauders looking to take your steaks off your grills. I just like being anywhere with Junior, Senior, and Diva. Sounds like a whole other type of movie. <laughs> wow. Yeah, really. <laughs> keep it hot, keep it clean, keep it lubricated. We have top men working on it right now. Ooh, top men. Top men for after dark, baby, yeah! Welcome back to the second hour, folks. Happy to have you aboard. Rod Gray will be joining us here in just a few minutes. Quick reminder about BBQTeamsOnline.com, baby. Look, Centralites, I hate to break the news. Centralites, the internet is not a fad. It's not going away next week. And if you don't have an internet presence, then you're losing valuable exposure. You know what that means? Revenues. Money. Cashola, bitch. Hook up and get your piece of the pie online. If you're not a tech geek, don't worry about it. For a small monthly investment, you can own your own spot on the interwebs. Just like real estate, except a lot easier to maintain. And, and you can start with a 30-day free trial. No risk. Don't even worry about it. Mike Ryan, happy to help you out. It's a fully customizable website for you, made possible by bbqteamsonline.com. That's the website. And again, 30-day free trial. What's not to what's not to try about that? Give me a break. 30-day free trial. All right, Rod Gray coming up again, as I just said there a few seconds ago. Uh, a couple quick emails here before we get to him. This one from Crash. Greg, there's only two good things about the new format. Barbecue Pitmasters Season 2. And they're both wearing Daisy Dukes, baby! Yeah. What do you mean? What does that mean? I didn't see Myron or Art Smith in Daisy Dukes. <laughs> Sorry. Don't get it. Thank you for Crash for that. Also, uh, Don, uh, hi, Greg. When I heard Season 2 was a go, I inquired about entering. And here was their reply when I heard some of the great teams entering. I did not send in a tape. But their reply was interesting. Oh, that's lengthy. Damn it. All right, well, let's hear what they say. We don't discriminate here. Send us a good audition tape, and you have a good chance to get uh, as anyone good luck, and we look forward to seeing your tape. There is going to be a season two of Barbecue Pitmasters. Great news for all those guys and gals who want to be on the show. Here's how you can apply. Good luck to all those who send in their DVDs for season two Barbecue Pitmasters audition tape. Under five minutes, sell us on you and your team. Then uh, all the... Shipping information. Shoot schedule runs from April 30th to June 26th. Send questions there as well. Don't forget to include your contact info. We don't discriminate, baby. Hey, they don't. I mean, you know, everybody's pretty well represented there, I guess. Uh, Racially and uh, ethnically and all that. You know, there's women, there's men, all that great stuff. So certainly, uh, I guess they didn't lie about that. No doubt about it. Thanks, Don, for writing in. You should have sent in the tape anyway, just because you hear who's going in. I mean, obviously, they didn't peck, uh, you know, the, the best of the best out there on the... I mean, certainly they did in some instances, but... Well, you know what I mean. I put my foot in my mouth too much. And by the way, you know, uh, as much as I, I, I kind of... Uh, I'm not a fan of that new format of uh, Pitmasters Season 2, I think it's not... Bad. You know, if you want to have a show with just... You know, some of the really good barbecue competition cooks out there, or really good barbecue cooks in general, have a show. Make the show, right? And then just don't call it Barbecue Pitmasters, because when you keep the same name and the, and the format was so deviant from 
the, from first to the second season. It's it's not, you know, it's like uh, watching minute to win it, and then the second season, it's like five minutes to win it. But you're calling it minute to win it. I mean, it's just not the same show. It's not. It's, it's not representing what competition barbecue was like it was in the first season. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and race over to the hotline, baby. Joining me now is a show favorite since the inception of the live show. They've been on one of the most dominant barbecue teams over the past three years and currently sitting in second place overall for 2010 with their win this past weekend. They automatically qualified to go to the Jack Daniels again this year. And, oh, yeah, they happen to be the reigning team of the year for the Kansas City Barbecue Society and riding a very nice wave of momentum over the past two weeks in competition. It's pitmaster of Pellet Envy Barbecue Competition cooking team and friend of the show, Rod Gray, joining us here after dark. Rod, how are you, buddy? Hey, Greg, how are you? I'm doing very well, Rod. Thanks for asking, and I appreciate you coming on tonight. You were uh, over there in Emporia, Kansas this past weekend taking part in that Flint Hills Beef Fest barbecue contest, and you end up taking grand championship honors out of 45 teams there. Anything out of the ordinary that you had to contend with this past weekend, or was it just Pellet Envy business as usual? Well, it was Pellet Envy business as usual for me, (laughs) but uh, i got to tell you, I didn't feel welcome there. From the minute I got there, people were saying, what are you doing there? What are you doing here? Which really, honestly, kind of set me on my heels a little bit, almost as much as the way you brought the heat to start the show at 8 o'clock. That was pretty amazing for you to cut into barbecue pitmasters like that. But, uh, uh, you know, we just go under a tent. People see us show up. We prep our meat like everybody else. We cook our meat like everybody else. We turn it in like everybody else. And I guess sometimes we have a little luck. What uh, so? What gives with the with the attitude over there? People didn't want to see you come to that event, or you weren't supposed to show up there, or what? Yeah, well, I guess I wasn't supposed. To, I guess that one wasn't open to everybody. Um, you know, honestly, Greg, Sam's Club, uh, working with with KCBS, did a pretty cool thing uh, this year. They actually created an invitational contest, and uh, they wanted to bring the best of the best down to their first ever Sam's Club store, and so they threw. 25 grand in the hat and invited the 25 best teams in the country to come cook. And, and, uh, so everybody expected, I guess, all the power to be down in Midwest city, Oklahoma this last weekend. And, um, I, you know, I'm not alone. There were a couple of us who decided that we needed to go a different direction. I had originally planned to be in, in, in Midwest city, Oklahoma. And, uh, honestly, we were cooking pretty well, but we only had two weeks left to get that magical number seven win to be an automatic to the Jack Daniels World, World Championship. And, and we thought we better have two weekends to try to get it instead of just one. So we stopped off in Emporia at the Beef Fest, one of our favorite old-time contests. Um, that was one of the, our first year. That, that was one of the contests we won in our first year. And we were actually cooked there a lot of years. But we'd last couple of years we've been on hiatus. We've been somewhere else doing something. And so we just wanted to go back. We've got friends there. I went to college in Emporia at Emporia State, go Hornets, and – uh, so we saw some good friends and had a little fun and, and did a little cooking. If the Sam's Club Invitational had been uh, two, three, four, five weeks before this past weekend, is it something that you would have taken part in? Or two weeks later, and, and the word's absolutely yes. Uh, I love that Sam's Club finally recognizes that all these years us barbecuers have been going in and buying hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of their stuff and using it at competitions all over the country and finally – I think they're taking note of that and realizing that, that we're a, a decent part of their business. And uh, so they're getting involved with, with competition and barbecue. And I think that's a great thing for competition and barbecue. I think it's a great thing for Sam's Club as well. Rod Gray from uh, Pitmaster of Pellet Envy joining us. PelletEnvy.com is his website, by the way. Uh, also, if you're a, a Twitter person, at Pellet Envy is his Twitter handle. Rod, we were going back and forth a little bit during the end of last week, kind of getting you locked down for tonight. You had mentioned on Thursday that you were – kind of competition hunting for that number seven, which you end up getting. Uh, what, what was the criteria used to pick that event, which ultimately led to Emporia? Were there uh, potentially other competitions this past weekend that you also had on the target mark? Well, there were, there were several contests going on, um, and I really kind of had three choices. Excelsior Springs, Missouri, um, which is a great, great event. Uh, go down to Emporia or go another like 50 miles and cook in El Dorado, Kansas. And honestly, I cooked Excelsior last year. I've been away from Emporia for a couple of years. Um, my best man from my wedding and a very good friend and his wife 
um, live in Emporia with their family. And ultimately, we just decided we we're familiar with Emporia. We hadn't been there in a few years, and, and we were going to go down there and give it a shot. They like, they've liked our food there in the past, um, and, and we just decided it would be fun to go there. Besides, Greg, you, you, you're talking to Mike Wozniak about how much he travels. You know, we travel as much, if not more, than, than Mike and Beth do, a lot of it by myself. It is so rare that I can leave the house at 1 p.m. on a Friday, <laughs> arrive at a contest, and be home, cleaned up, and, and done things put away by 6 p.m. on a Saturday. I mean, ordinarily, I'm gone from Thursday through Sunday, if not longer. So that was a big deciding factor, too. Very close contest to home. So does it give you any type of extra satisfaction? You know, you go back there because you've had success, you, you like it there, and then you kind of get uh, a little bit of a standoffish attitude as you're kind of making it sound. Is it extra special sweet for you when you go in there and kick everybody's ass? <laughs> no. And by the way, uh, we didn't <laughs> kick anybody's ass at that event. Truth be told, um, as, as we were rolling through the awards, we had uh, Pork Me Purple, a Kansas City team, out of Olathe, who had four strong calls. And then we had a young guy who's pretty new at this, Holy Smokes, a guy named Mark. Um, and Mark and I are friendly. And Mark had two seconds and a first, and then a no call in pork. And, 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 and to, to all you companies of barbecue cooks, you know how many times a three-call guy jumps up and beats the field with, with a couple of guys with four calls. So we went right down to the very end, and, and we weren't sure uh, where we were at until they called us for grand. So when you turn everything in, uh, and, and as we've talked before in the past year, uh, one of those pitmasters that actually uh, goes ahead and, and tests all their food or taste tests all their food before you turn it in, uh, were you were you happy? Good with, memory. Yeah, were, were you happy with what you turned in, and it's yeah. like oh no, or were you not happy with anything? And of course, then you pull out the win. Well, now now I want to test your memory even further. You know my attitude about my competition <laughs> food. You know I always think I can do better. You know I always think that, that things aren't perfect. So, so nothing changed down there. Uh, we tried our chicken, um, you know, and, and, and Sherry said it's just okay. It was a little dry, she thought. We even gave a piece to a neighbor who thought it was a little bit dry. So we weren't sure what we had there. The ribs, i got to be honest with you, something happened with us and ribs that has never happened to us before. We cook four slabs of ribs, and we taste a bone off of each of the four slabs. And, and we're primarily trying to determine our tenderness because we can adjust our taste if we need to, and, and if it's too sweet or if it's too hot or if it's too salty or whatever, we can make those adjustments before it goes in the box. So we tasted our ribs, and uh, we landed on a couple of slabs. And, it's, and, and then my final decision comes as I'm actually cutting them. It's one of the reasons I never use an electric knife. I always use a regular, I use a six-inch curved boning knife to cut my ribs because that's my final test because as I'm slicing through each of those individual ribs, I can kind of get a feel for the tenderness as it moves down that slab of ribs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got our two slabs of ribs going. The second slab we didn't like so well. We moved on to a third slab of ribs. We got our box all done, and as Sherry's closing the lid on the box to go turn it in, I grabbed that last slab that we haven't, hadn't really done much with, and I cut it in half just to cut the slab in half to get it in a Ziploc bag. And those are, the, those are the most tender or the most appropriately tender ribs that I'd cut that day. And I said, Sherry, I think we made a mistake. Um, I've got some good ribs here. And she said, Rod, we have time. Do you want to change them out? So I said, no. We stood there for a minute. I ended up cutting those up, removing some ribs out of the box, and putting those in. And we ended up with fifth place ribs. And ultimately, it, it was you know, definitely important in terms of how the wind came out. So I've never done that before. I've never second-guessed myself to the point of, of taking stuff out of the box like that and changing it out, but we did it this weekend. Rod Gray of uh, Pellet Envy joining us here after dark on the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Uh, Rod, you know, you said uh, here before that you'll do a number of these competitions by yourself, uh, but then also you have your wife Sherry with you uh, on a, a good percentage of those as well. So for that particular instance, if you would have been by yourself, would you have even bothered to cut into that last slab of ribs, or, no. uh, or, or would you have second-guessed yourself at all? No, when I'm by myself, I'm in, I'm in sort of a zone, and truthfully, I think it's probably cost me a few contests. In fact, um, something very similar to that happened to me in Lebanon, Tennessee, the last year they had that event, the Amazing Blazing, in that I was by myself. I actually had Mike Peters from the, KC, from the Kansas City Barbecue Society tour over in my spot trying his ribs with me, and he landed on a certain slab of ribs, and I disagreed, so I 
got my ribs in the box and turned them in. And then somebody came by and asked me if I had any leftover ribs. And so I had that one slab I hadn't really messed with, so I cut those up. And this was a very experienced barbecue person, by the way, who, who walked away, came back in 15 minutes and said it was, it was, those were some of the best ribs they had ever eaten, and they'd eaten hundreds and hundreds of ribs. That day, ribs kept me from winning the contest. So uh, I say Sherry was probably the factor there that got me to do that. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have even messed with it. So what's it like for you as a dynamic when you're going to the competitions by yourself and when you're going to the competitions with Sherry? I mean, I would imagine that it has to be easier with her, but when you're by yourself and you pull off a grand, or, or let's say it's not even a grand or, a, or an overall, but you have a really good finish, is it a little bit more satisfying when you're there by yourself? Or conversely, is it more satisfying when you're there with your wife? No, it's more satisfying when Sherry's there for sure. For me, Greg, for me it is. Um, you know, uh, in terms of preparation, I'd like to talk to you about when I'm by myself and when she's with me, the difference in how I, how I compete. Yeah. I think I'm more focused when I'm by myself. I think I'm completely on point. I'm probably even less social than most people think of me when I'm by myself because I'm kind of in a zone. I have a lot of things I have to get done by myself on Friday evening so that I can get some sleep and so that I can get my pit lit and get things done the next day in a sequence that gives me a little bit of time so I'm not just completely maxed out all day Saturday. When Sherry's there, some of that falls onto her shoulders, which just makes it easier on me, and I'm probably a little more relaxed as I cook. I don't know if that hurts me, but it's just, it's just a different day um, than it is when I'm by myself. So there is a, big, there is a difference there. Uh, and back to your original question, I would never tell you that it's more satisfying to win a contest by yourself. Um, I would much rather have Sherry there to share it with me. So two weeks ago, you're up at Michigan Speedway for Ronnie Cates' event. You took reserve there. You've done a lot of these competitions, and how do you evaluate what's make, you know, and I say competitions just in a general sense, not the Ronnie Cates events, but how do you evaluate yourself? What makes a event really good or, or really bad, one that you would think about either never going back to or one that you're putting on already the calendar for next year? You know, I get, I get a very similar question to that in a different way, and the question is what are some of your favorite events? And I got to be honest with you, I'm cooking weekend, weekend and week out every weekend. And they're all kind of running together on me. I evaluate my contest on several factors. One, I really want a well run event. I think that makes, I think it makes it more fun for the cooks. Two, I'd like to be able to at least have the opportunity to win back what I've invested in the event. You know, if I go to an event that doesn't have enough prize money that I can't at least win back what I have invested in it. That's kind of a, and it's not that I win every weekend. Don't get me wrong. Notice I'm saying at least have the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some events out there. If you don't win the whole thing, then then you don't even cover your expenses. And and while those are great for some people, uh, take it or leave it. This is my business, and, and and I need to try to at least have the opportunity to find the events where I can I can get that back. Um, you know, and then for me, Greg, I have a factor that a lot of guys don't need to consider, and that is I'm looking for. Uh, attendance. I want a lot of people at the events because that's good for my sponsors, Grease Lightning and Easy Grill. And without them, I couldn't do this. So, so that's that aspect of it is a little different than a lot of guys. They don't they don't consider like going to Michigan International Speedway because there's going to be a lot of people there who are ultimately going to get a lot of views of my banners or get product samples or see me cooking on the Easy Grill or some of those things that are important to the guys who help me help me do this as a career. So when you're taking into account all of the competitions, let's say you've cooked over the past two years, uh, you've certainly took grand champion on a number of these, you've taken reserve grand on a certain portion of those, and you've finished well in, in all the remaining ones, let's say. Do you put those on uh, some type of spreadsheet and say, okay, for the following year we did really well in these particular events, and because we did well this year we're going to go back there next year because the flavors are working there, or does that – tend to change from year to year and you can't bank on that we do some of that we actually do some of that um we do a little bit in reverse uh in that we haven't had a lot of success in a state just north of kansas i'm gonna let you decide which one that is <laughs> and so we don't cook there a lot um and but we have a lot of success in a state that's a little bit south and east of here um a state i've threatened to move to several times and that'd be arkansas for some reason our style of barbecue it, uh, seems to, to work well in, in that state I mean, we've had a lot of success there. So, yeah, we do a little bit of that, sure, sure. And I don't know anybody who competes a lot who doesn't do a little bit of that. However, I think a lot of it is superstition and in our head because 
you know, these days, a lot of the judges travel just as much as we do. So you, it's hard to really regionalize what's good and what's bad. Um, but, but to answer your question in, in, a, in a little bit of a twisted way, sure, we do that. So I had mentioned in the open your reigning team of the year in KCBS. You're currently sitting second right now. Uh, it moved up a, a spot there from uh, last week with the win. Last year at this time, you were top the leaderboard, and obviously what turned out to be a very exciting finish for the season. <laughs> Maybe not in your eyes, but as far as people that were watching it, it was very exciting. Iowa Smokey D's uh, not going to be making the race this year because of other priorities they're tending to. I smell smoke certainly doing well again this year. And, of course, the other teams in the top ten right now are all strong, uh, to mention uh, QOW and Parrothead Smokers and Munch and Hogs at the Hilton. Are you looking at a repeat of this year? Will you really not make that all-out chase again if it comes down to it? Because it sounded like uh, in the second segment of the first hour, Mike Wozniak was in it for the long haul. <laughs> I heard that. Uh, I did. I heard that. Um, and I'm not so sure Mike just wasn't doing a little posturing <laughs> because you really didn't ask him that question, yet he was able to provide you the answer that he intends to go all the way to Phoenix. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. If if October or November rolls around and we're in that position, uh, I would have told you right after that last year that I would not chase it again. In fact, I may have told you that, that I doubt I would chase it again. But uh, it's a new year, and uh, I'm a little bit rejuvenated we're cooking well right now. Last two events are two reserves and two grands. And I'll be honest with you, if we get to November and we're in it, and it's and it's it's got to be probably a little bit more than just a mathematical chance of winning team of the year, because that that would that's going to be a crazy last four or five weeks. But I've done it before, and I plan to do it again. So no uh, no Brett Farr for Rod Gray, right? No no, I'm not bowing <laughs> out. No, we'll, we'll go the distance if we if that's what we need to do. That's what we're going to do. Rod Gray from Pella Denby joining us here on the show after dark Barbecue Central radio show. I mentioned Ronnie Cates' uh, name a few minutes ago. You know, there was talk a little bit earlier in the year, Rod, about him potentially splitting away from the KCBS and starting his own competition series that would have its own rules and judges. That talk certainly is tempered quite a bit. But you're somebody that's been around this game for a long time. You've seen things come and go. Do you see this happening at some point, Rod, where somebody's factioning off and, and making a whole different scene where there's a mutual? Or do you think that, regardless, there's always going to be a mutual need for Ronnie and the KCBS to remain together in order for both of them to be successful? Mm, for, you know, let's, let's, let's deal with the last part of your question first, and that's about them both being successful. I'm not so sure they need each other to both be successful. Um, you know, I've got a little personal bias. I'd like to see Ronnie hang in there. And I'd like to see him help KCBS grow and see KCBS help him grow. Uh, I understand some frustration. There's a lot of crazy crap going on in the boardroom. Uh, it's the reason that I left the board. It's just ridiculous. Um, they need to f- focus on business and quit dealing with, the, with all the minutiae that they deal with. Um, and, and that's what's causing a breakdown. And that's what's causing Ronnie heartache. Um, and I can see where he would want to take his ball and go play somewhere else, honestly. And I would say of anybody out there, he probably has the biggest ability to do that if that's what he wants to do. And who would fault him for it, for what's going on? But uh, I, personally, I would love to see those guys work together to make barbecue bigger and better. And I think they'd be a good team in doing that. Uh, you've been on the board. You, you've seen I didn't even intend to go down this road, Rod, but uh, you, you opened the door, so why not kick it in with both feet? Uh, as someone who has been inside the actual board of directors at KCBS and you hear it from, uh, whether it be internet forums or I'm sure you're hearing it on uh, the competition trail at other people's uh, venues and tents at competitions that you're at, I mean, it's the same thing that you hear over and over again, minutia, infighting, not looking forward and, and thinking bigger picture. What needs to happen in order to get the KCBS ship righted and going in the right direction? Well, you know, I, I'm gonna, I want to back up to the part of that. I did open this door, but I will tell you that <laughs> since I've left the board, I don't know that I've read the minutes in the bullshit one time. I know I've never called it and listened to the meeting, and honestly, I pretty much avoid all conversations about what goes on in the boardroom, and I'll tell you why. Because regardless of all the crap that's stirred up in that boardroom, Competition barbecue is, is business as usual out here in the field. Um, those guys, they they need to realize that um, there's something much bigger going on than them being up, than them being at a board meeting last week till 1 a.m. talking about such minor minor details. We're still out here cooking barbecue, and and the contests are still going great. And why they can't see that and 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 figure out a better way to do it, you know, I don't know the answer to it, but. That's the answer, is, is let's focus on the business at hand 
they could those meetings could last one hour and they could do a lot more good for the for the membership. As far as the membership goes, it's like any other topic. Someone's always going to have an opinion and they're always going to differ and we're never all going to agree. But you know what? We speak with our vote and we vote for the people we want in office. And if we don't want them in office anymore, we need to vote their butts out. Rod Gray from Pellet Envy joining us here on the show. The website again, pelletenvy.com, and his Twitter handle, uh, at Pellet Envy. And he's sponsored by Greased Lightning and uh, what is it, Easy Grill? Easy Grill. Yeah, Easy Grill. Uh, so, Rod, competition barbecue certainly increases in popularity, regardless of any skirmishes in any type of boardroom through any sanctioning body. Many teams looking to ramp up their skills as quickly as possible. Uh, part of that's being done by taking competition cooking classes. You're obviously part of uh, one that teaches uh, or, or that's sought after by many, uh, many people out there right now regarding classes. Uh, is there something that you would suggest teams do? Or do you have other items that they need to consider first before they look into taking a class? No, I don't. I, I, based on what we're doing, especially, and what some other folks are doing, um, I believe you should probably take a class very, very early on. I think you're going to cut a lot. I think you're going to cut a lot of time and a lot of money off your learning curve for competition barbecue. I mean, Greg, I'm going to blow my own horn here and tell you we've taught almost 700 people. And we had a young man and his father come to the class here at the end of July, and they've won two contests since then. They've entered three, and they'd never won a contest before. So uh, I think I think and and I'm and let's not just talk about Pellet Envy classes. Let's talk about classes in general because I think that's more fair. Because there are other guys out there doing this. They're probably not as good as I am at it, but they're still doing it. Of course. It. Um, I, I I think that I think you should take a class. I think you should take two classes, maybe three classes. There's more than one right way to cook barbecue, but the guys who are doing it, for the most part, know what they're talking about, and, and I think you could gain some great experience and, and really cut your learning curve by jumping in and taking a class. Uh, certainly you have. Oh, Go ahead. Having said that, Greg, may I add something, please? Please. I get about three emails a day from you folks wanting a class. I'm going to tell you the 2010 schedule is closed. No more classes for Pellet Envy this year. We're working on our 2011 schedule. When it's up, I'll get it posted, and you guys can have at it. But no more classes for Pellet Envy for 2010. Could you do a, a whole full-time job just going out and hanging up the, the competition cleats and just teaching classes? Um, I, think, I think I could teach classes full-time, sure. But um, there, where's the thrill of the victory in that? And truthfully, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a parts and pieces thing here. We, we're out cooking in the trenches and doing well which is the best way to promote our classes. It also is the best way for us to have sponsorship. Without the sponsorship and the classes, we can't do the competition, but without being successful in competition, we don't have the classes and we don't have the sponsors. So it's all kind of rolled into one tight little ball. Now, I know you don't have any statistical data here to pull from, so I just would like your candid opinion here, but as you see new teams coming into the competition scene, however they found out about competition barbecue, do you find that there's a bigger majority or, or, or at least a, a majority of some sort that the teams want to get out there and win and get money? Or do you still think that the majority of these guys are just out there to have some fun? They have five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 to blow for a weekend, and, and that's what they want to do instead of going to Las Vegas or wherever else. If they have five or six or seven hundred dollars to blow for the weekend, they should come see me. I could probably give them a lot better ideas and have they'd have a lot more fun than coming to a contest. The people I see coming out now seem to be more competitive than some of the older folks who have been out just to have a good time at one or two or three events. Um, I'm I'm seeing a lot of new faces in these classes who want to win right off the bat, and and these are guys that I don't think we saw back in. 2001, 2002, 2003. I mean, there's always been a, a core group of folks who are just driven to, and they're just competitive and driven and want to win. But it seems to me, especially maybe with the, the season one of Pitmasters last year, I think there are more and more folks who come out in this who want to succeed at it. I don't know if it's driven by the money or just the success of, of competing and winning, but there's definitely more competitive folks doing this than I think there were 10 years ago. So speaking of classes, Rod, there's certainly – and you – Kind of made a, a mention of it here just a few minutes ago. There's definitely been a proliferation of these classes here, especially over like the past two years or so. If I were to stroke you a check to pay for a class, which one would you choose right now and why? If you were to, if you were to have me point you in a direction, basically for a class. No, if I'm going to write a check for you to take a class. Oh, 
yeah. Nobody cares um, what class I want to take, Rod. Let's be honest. <laughs> that's a that's a fabulous question, and Oops. I think I'm. You know, um, wow, wow, Greg, you painted me into a corner, buddy. I don't really know the answer to that. I'm probably going to lean. I would love to learn how to cook a great whole hog, not necessarily in competition. But just to have that ability to, to have the skills and the knowledge to cook a great whole hog. And I don't mean a little pig like we cook at the colossal thing. I mean a big 200-pound hog. So I'm going to lean toward Myron Nixon's class um, uh, probably by default would probably be my answer. Just because of uh, name and, and reputation and winning in the past? Because of the hog. Now, no, no, no. If Melissa Cooks is thinking about teaching a class, Melissa, you have my number. Um, I would love to come a, teach a, to, to take a class from Melissa. Well, the good news is, Rod, that she actually does teach cooking classes. She does. I did not <laughs> know that. Of course. Uh, Melissa, I expect commission check because I believe I just signed Rod up for you right here on the show. Uh, I think you did, too. I did not know that about oh, yeah. Melissa. Yeah, they love uh, giving cooking classes. So whole hog is something that you would like uh, to, to get a little bit more proficient on? Yeah, that's something we don't do much up here around Kansas City. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just something I'd like to add to my repertoire, to be able to cook a decent whole hog. Um, honestly, I've never really tried it. We've cooked some, you know, some 50-pound piglets at Colossal. In fact, we won Scotty Johnson from, I think it's, I think it's uh, Big Johnson, I think, tonight yeah. is his handle. And uh, <laughs> Steve Farron from I Smell Smoke and I all went to Colossal our first year for all three of us. And, and uh, as you know, that was a four-pork category, ribs, pork butts pork loin and hog we got to call in hog and in loin and not of the two we were proficient at and we won colossal so we've done a little of that but but that was that they would all agree there was a lot of luck there do you think or do you have any interest in in getting out every once in a while and doing a uh, memphis barbecue network style of competition where you're entering hog or maybe you're even entering all three i know it's a, it's a little bit different monster where teams can actually just choose to enter one of the three some people triple enter but would you consider doing uh, maybe more of those here in the future or do you just want to stick with the kcbs right now well i think it's a new challenge I, you know we've cooked a few of the mim style and or mbn events you know we were in memphis in may year before last uh, our first time ever and we do an event in Washington, D.C. We have for the last three years. So we've done a little bit of that. Um, you know, I guess there's a learning curve there that I haven't quite grasped because we're not, we're not proficient at it, I will tell you that. So uh, it, it would be a great new challenge. And when I have time for that, I would love to give that more of a try. But especially this year, Greg, it's been so, it's been so crazy. There's just no time to, to, to leap out and try new things. Keeping with that cooking class thought of mine here just for a couple more seconds, you know, I understand the teams want to ramp up as quickly as possible and win in order to kind of recoup some of that expense that they're incurring. And it, it's certainly not cheap. No one knows that better than you, especially when you're doing it on a regular basis. But when the new teams take what they learned in a class and apply it directly into their cooking methods, and then the team teaching that class continues to use, obviously, what they taught, are we not in a spot where there could actually be kind of this flavor profile deficit thing and, and the evolution of flavor profiles could be jeopardized? I think it's possible. You know, there was some some guy from Kansas posted on uh, a forum here this week that uh, he was down in the mouth because he cooked two or three contests and didn't do well, and it really sounded more like sour grapes than anything, but he was commenting about specific things like smoking guns hot and blues hog, and that's all you really need to win a barbecue contest. <laughs> and, you know, but but here's the thing, and, and some, people, some people on that specific forum jumped back, and this was their reply, and they said, don't you think – that even if you gave everybody on at, at an event the, those same two products, Smoking Guns Hot and Blues Hog Original Sauce, and they all used it to cook and turn in their products, don't you think that the cream would still rise at the top? And, and I don't know about you, but I think that it would because there's more to it than having a flavor profile. You have to know how to cook it. You have to know how to adapt to the environment. You have to know how to adapt to things that are going on in your pit and around your pit and make some subtle changes that make your product come out better. You have to know how to select your meat, trim your meat, and cook your meat. There's way more to it than a couple of sauces and rubs. Um, so flavor profile or not, not to mention, Greg, and this is what you hear all the time, but you can, give, you can have two or three people cook the exact same recipe, and it'll come out two or three different ways. Rod Gray joining us here from Pellet Envy. PelletEnvy.com is the website. Uh, you know, Rod, I've, I've heard that some pissed – Piss. pit masters don't like to eat their own competition barbecue and, and what they make at home is like completely different conversely of course i've had some pit masters tell me they love their competition stuff and it's what they eat at home as well where do you fall into this conversation i hate barbecue in general i don't cook it at home and i don't eat what i cook on the road 
So, well, I mean, why you do it? Well, it's not about the barbecue. No? There's way more to it than that. This has become my career, fortunately or unfortunately. You know, if you have to have a job, this one doesn't suck. But it is my job now. And my job is to get out there, rub elbows with the guys, compete, attempt to win because that draws attention to your team, and, you know, garner some sponsorship that else pay for it. And truthfully, Greg, I can't complain about what I'm doing. I don't know how much longer I can do it. I mean, I probably have a couple, two or three or four or five years left in me, maybe. But this really shouldn't be my ultimate career goal, I hope, because I'm too old and fat to do this every weekend for 35, 40 weekends a year. Um, but it, it's not about eating the barbecue. There's way more to it than that. I guess so my thought initially for asking that question is when I ask people how they get into it, I would say 95% of the time a dad used to cook barbecue and they were taught or they were around someplace that had really good barbecue. That There was some type of pulling in where they had a, a romance or a desire to want to make and eat and they liked barbecue and, and then that progressed into competition. That's not the case for you. Well, I, I had something similar, but, but, but not what you described. And what happened to me was I had an office manager named Jennifer and Jennifer's father was on the old time team PDT of a wildly successful Kansas city team. PDT stood for Pat, Donna and Ted. Now they say it stands for pretty damn tasty and it consists of Donna and Ted McClure, but Pat, the obvious odd man out was Jennifer's father. And so after he was odd man out, he and his daughter would cook a contest once or twice a year. And in 2001, we built a new speedway here in Kansas City. And Jeff Staney of Oklahoma Joe's fame and of Slaughterhouse Five fame, uh, a really successful team, um, was asked to host a barbecue contest out there. Big prize money. I think it was 40 grand back in 2001. That's a lot of money in, in 2001. That's a ton of money in, in 2001. So he hosted a barbecue contest on the infield of the brand new Kansas Speedway. And Jennifer invited me out. It was July. I think it was 103 that day. I come out there on a Friday, and, and Greg, it had to be, it had to be 110 degrees on the asphalt. It had to be new black asphalt. Here were 200 teams. They all looked like they were having an absolute blast. There were baby pools with, with lawn chairs in them for people to cool off. Everybody was having a party. I met Dave Close and Paul Kirk, two big-time barbecue celebrities, so all this fun going on, despite all this miserable heat, I went home that night. Sherry was on vacation somewhere. I sat down at the computer. I found some barbecue on the Internet, and I read about it until the sun came up. I decided that if it could be that miserable and all those people could be having that much fun, I had to be a part of it. I had to take part in what they were doing, and that's how I got started. Hmm. So uh, that should have been like one of the first questions I've ever asked you, uh, and you've been on the show like six times, but that's why we keep having you back, because you always got a, a great new anecdote to share with us. And again, we're talking with Rod Gray, pitmaster of Pellet Envy. PelletEnvy.com is the website, at Pellet Envy is the Twitter handle. Uh, you know, Rod, one of the items that generated quite a bit of buzz last year was the announcement that your team name, Pellet Envy, was going to be in its last year of use uh, this year. So... How has the search gone for a new name? Have you decided on a few to pick from yet? What's happening with that? It, it hasn't gone very well, Greg. Um, I'm still committed to, 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 to considering the, the team name change, but honestly, a lot of people um, have, have sort of reminded me that we have a lot of brand equity in the name Pellet Envy. It's been around 10 years now. Uh, it's you know, 2009 national champions. So we're current, Pellet Envy's current national champions. You know, we've won some big events. That, that's one funny thing about Pellet Envy. Somehow, uh, we're very, very lucky in that we, we, we often will win a big event, you know, once a year, which is just uncanny. I don't, know, I don't know how it happens, but it does. And so there's been a lot of press about Pellet Envy. So honestly, I've discussed it with my sponsors. I've talked it over with my wife. We have a lot of logo gear. I mean, obviously, our trailer's wrapped with Pellet Envy. So I'm really on the fence about it. Um, one of my sponsors says, we've invested in Rod Gray, do what you want to do. One of my sponsors says, well, you know, Pellet Envy has a lot of brand equity there. We hate to see you change, but you make that call. My wife says, don't change. I'd love to change. Um, of course, my, the leading candidate for a new team name was F-Bomb Barbecue, but Sherry will not let <laughs> me change to that. So um, I'm going to keep the other secret here for a while until I can finally make a decision on it. What relevance does F-Bomb Barbecue have? None. It has absolutely none. <laughs> but who would name their team that? Who would name their team Pellet Envy? 
I mean, honestly, uh, you know, we're trying to we're, – we're going for a little bit of shock value with a, with a new team name if we can get that far. Well, Same I mean, as the old one. It's going to be really hard to replace Pellet Envy, truthfully. Yeah, I mean, Pellet Envy, obviously, a lot of people using Pellet Cookers, Pellet Envy. You can get that. Obviously, there's that, you know, that, that the kind of uh, uh, phallic uh, reference to, you know, the Pellet Envy, Penis Envy type thing, which obviously is nice. Uh, F-Bomb Barbecue is great. I mean, you can look, to me, just going up and down the KCBS and then the NBN and, and the FBA team names and seeing – how the hell these people came up with them. That's like one of my favorite questions to ask a new guy when they come on is how you come <laughs> up with the team names, just like when I had uh, um, Ryan Amos and Logan Hendrickson on from Hot Grill on Grill Action. I mean, one of the best team names ever. I mean, the, it, uh, Yeah, you got to give a shout out to those guys. That is a fabulous <laughs> team name. Honestly, I'd never heard it until the, the Pitmaster show last week or the week before, whatever that was, and that really is a, that really is a, a fun team name. All right, so you're a businessman. And as we talk about the potential name change, it sounds like you're all in. You have a few other people on the fence and one person telling you to uh, just go ahead and do whatever you want because they like Rod Gray first and everything else a second. Do you think making such a bold move would have some potential business ramifications for you if you did that? And is that a real concern for you? Or do you think that if you made the team, uh, team name change – that because of the success that you've had in the past, you would be able to kind of reestablish yourself and relaunch even maybe perhaps bigger and better? Well, I think it's possible. You know, I'm not going to go into all the businesses that have changed their names over the years and, and uh, they're still doing great or actually doing better because that's boring. Uh, and I think, I think everything we've talked about tonight has been pretty boring from my end of it, so I'm not going to do that to you. But um, I think I could overcome it. I think with a little bit of branding and some great marketing, I think I can definitely overcome a name change. I just have to decide if I really want to put that much effort into rebranding this team. And, and you, know, uh, you know, when there are bigger things on the plate like satisfying your sponsors and trying to win some barbecue contests and looking at the potential of chasing team of the year again, I think that takes a back burner, honestly. Rod, a uh, quick email from uh, Big Johnson. Wanted to know where you got the big cowboy hat from, and was that the last one ever made? <laughs> Oh, Big Johnson's a funny guy, isn't he? Um, you know, that cowboy hat wasn't really even a cowboy hat. That was just a palm leaf hat out in Reno. Uh, the year that Johnny Trigg was invited to cook on the the Versus series of what I – I don't remember the name of it, Championship Pitmaster Series or whatever, and Johnny took me along as a sidekick. And I got to tell you, Reno in September is one damn hot place to be. So there was a street vendor there selling hats, and – I thought I had one picked out. Now the corner of my eye, I see this big old thing. It looks almost like a trash bag over there in the corner, and and uh, and, and realize that it's a hat. And and I had to have it. I had to. Have it. What's cool about that hat? You see it in some pictures on my website. Um, but what's cool about that hat? People don't know. You dunk that dude in a tub of water, and you can shape it any way you want. <laughs> when it dries, it stays that way. And then when you're tired of that, you just dunk it in the water again and shape it again. It is a really cool hat. I still have it. But I look a little silly in it, so it doesn't get worn the way it used to. So this is obviously a an outpouring of green, seething jealousy of, of, from Scotty Johnson about the hat. It appears so, yeah. Uh, and actually, I had the hat, I believe, the year that we won Colossal up there. And, and I think he's still unhappy that he wasn't able to snatch it away from me that weekend. So you, you brought up the sh- uh, you know one of the, the competition shows here just recently. And, of course, my uh, easy, uh, succulent transition into talking about Pitmasters 2 <laughs> was, uh, you know, Rod, why not keep Pellet Envy the team name? Uh, season 2 of Barbecue Pitmasters, nothing like the first season, but they kept the same team name, so why not just follow suit? Uh, what are your, what's your take on Season 2 of Barbecue Pitmasters? Have you seen any of it? What do you think? Is, is there, can you dub in the little lawyer giving the disclaimer that this is my personal opinion and I don't <laughs> intend and I, I'm not out to actually... Uh, hurt anybody's feelings or something like that before we start this because Every, it could get ugly. Everybody is um, entitled to their own opinion here on the show. I know. I, you know, I, I'm not out to offend anyone, but um, I, I really finally, I finally read a comment somewhere out there that really kind of summed it up for me, and that is they changed the format so drastically. Why didn't they simply change the damn name of the show so that people weren't misconceived into believing that it was the same as last year? I think that would have solved a lot. There's so much heartbreak over the, over the change in format of the show this year. I think if they simply changed the name of the show a little bit, um, I think it would have solved a lot of the negative comments that are out there because, man, they're getting blasted. I don't know if you've gone to the Facebook page for TLC Pitmasters, the fan page, 
where there are, what, are 32,000 people? Yeah. But it's just a nonstop hate fest over there. There are so many people, and they're not barbecue people, by the way, because, you know, the downfall of, of season one was attributed to the barbecue people not getting on board with it, not liking it. Well, these people aren't the barbecue crowd, and they're not liking the show. Do you think, and uh, of course I've seen all the, the social media outlets, that, especially those Facebook pages, and it's uh, the Pitmasters Facebook page, but then it's also TLC's main page. It's also Kingsford main page, which is getting kind of like this collateral damage thing. If you have anything to do with season two right now, you're going to get blasted. Uh, you're, you're either getting blasted or you're going to get some. So uh, that's kind of where it is right now, which is unfortunate for the people that wanted to kind of get behind it. But nevertheless... Uh, don't yeah, you think, I gotta tell you, it makes me look like a genius. By the way, of course. Uh, what, did you consider, uh, you know, is submitting into season two at all, or did you want to stay away oh, from it altogether? Oh no, 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 Greg. I did submit for season two. Oh, all right. So w- I was, I was selected for season two. So what happens? I I chose not to participate. Is it a contractual thing, or did other things just come up? Yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth, and, and again, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but it was primarily contractual. Um, there were some things in the contract that I just, that just didn't set well with me. You know, I think they meant well, but, you know, and had they explained some things to me in a different way, I would have seen it in a different light. I was later told that that contract really was based on a game show contract, and a lot of the language that was in that contract was, like, federally mandated based on, you know, some problems they had with game shows in the 50s and 60s. But nobody said that to me. They just told me this is the deal. People are signing it. Um, you know, we asked for some carve outs and some concessions. They pushed back, and ultimately, we just, just they ultimately told us we our choices are sign it or don't sign it, and we decided not to sign it. Were there some other teams that were higher ranking? You know, in these uh, these national rankings through the different sanctioning bodies that were uh, similar experience that you had, or did more of them jump on board? You know, i got to tell you the truth. Um, we were amazed. And when I say we, there were a few of us who would talk back and forth a little bit. But we were amazed at how well they kept us quiet. Um, I'm still seeing teams. I have no idea who they are, where they came from, or how they got on the show. It right. uh, definitely wasn't based on their cooking ability. They must have had a damn good audition tape. But uh, truthfully, um, I, I don't have a clue. I don't know who was – you know, there were some stories out there, some teams being offered shots onto the show and then being called back and told – they weren't going to be on the show, which that would be just heartbreaking. And, and I don't really understand what happened there. But in, in terms of other teams who declined to be on the show based on, on contracts, I honestly cannot tell you for sure uh, about anybody else who did that. Would it have been a better show, or would it be a better show if, uh, and even if they tweaked season one's format a little bit, I mean, you look at all of these docudramas that are on television, as far as I'm concerned, it's the downfall of society. Reality television is is, is terrible. But uh, notwithstanding that, it wouldn't it have been better to follow, you know, you or uh, two or two or three other teams, maybe not even three, maybe just one or two, and really just show what they're doing, not at the competition, while they're traveling, what they're doing at the competitions, and it's almost like like all the other successful reality TV shows that are out there. You're seeing and getting to know the people. Oh, by the way, at the end of the show, they take a grand championship walk uh, somewhere in Kansas or you know up in New York State or wherever the hell it is. And it's almost it's not secondary, but it's the people first that make the show. And the competition barbecue thing is kind of that nice thing that, that ties the whole thing together. I just hope that when you get that show together and you're the executive producer, you'll give me a call <laughs> and at least give me a shot. Yeah. Well, I hope you can wait a little while. So now, yeah, um, no, I'll answer your question. Yes, I think so. You know, they said season one was a failure. They said they got to nine hundred thousand fans, but they needed a million to renew it. But I want to tell you that I watched that show. I watched every episode of that show. You know, and they made some people out to be villainous. You know, Myron kind of got a bad rap there. Uh, I don't, I don't know that he's actually that way. I'm not very close to Myron, but you know, Tuffy probably was portrayed. Tuffy and Johnny probably were portrayed. Um, as, as the way they really are or close to it. Um, probably Leanne, but I'm not, I, don't, I don't see Leanne that often. I consider her a friend, but, but I can't tell you if, if, uh, if she's really that mechanically challenged. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I know Harry so, and yeah, or Sue, or whatever it is, and, and uh, Harry's probably pretty well portrayed. I think they could have built on that. I really do. You know, the, the knock they said they got was TLC wanted winners and that they filmed these eight episodes, and that nobody really won. Well, that's not really true. There's a couple places in there where they don't show somebody winning a category that's on that show because they were overshadowed by something that, that one of the main characters was doing. 
Um, and there was a winner in an episode. Of course, he got it taken away from him, and that's a whole other topic. But, uh, but, but, you know, I will tell you this. On that series, I was told by an executive producer that I was slated number eight, but they took seven. And, and my response to that is, well, maybe if you'd have taken me, you'd still be doing the same format of season one because we did win a couple of contests during that period of time when they were filming that show. And if they needed winners, maybe they should have broadened their horizons a little bit and actually taken the goggles off and picked some winners to be on that show. But when you look at these shows, I mean, how, what, who's winning in these shows? And I'm not talking about Pitmasters, but I mean, is there a winner amongst Schnooky and the situation over here or midgets dating? <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about? It's exploiting people almost at their worst for the gratification of the viewing audience. And I, mean, I, I, I agree with you, Greg. However, I'm not sure the competition barbecue is quite the train wreck that some of these other reality shows are. You know, I want people to take notice of competition barbecue because that's what I'm doing, it, despite the fact that maybe it's just not that interesting. Maybe it just isn't, and we have to accept that. Because, my God, how many times can you show a guy be unhappy that his case of briskets is too light or that his ribs have spoiled or that his lettuce is limp? or that he's running out of ice, or whatever the next turmoil is. I mean, they're just kind of repetitive things. Um, and until you start just making up crap that really isn't happening at contests, I'm not sure you hold the interest of an audience for eight or ten episodes, but, but that's just me. Rod Gray from Pellet Envy joining us here on the show. Rod, just a couple more questions here before I let you go. You had kind of made that uh, delineation of cookers between uh, the Pellet uh, FEC 100s and the, the Jambo pit, and you're obviously cooking on the Jambo. Very nice-looking pit, by the way, from uh, what I've seen there on the Facebook and on your uh, blog web pages and all that good stuff. How, how is it using that cooker? You've had a lot of time, obviously, with, with the pellet cookers, but how do you feel the two are similar, if at all, and how are they completely different aside from the obvious? Uh, they're, they're absolutely not alike in any way. Let me start right there. You know, pellet cookers are a lot of automation. They're mechanical. They require power. My gear pit, by the way, I want to shout out to, to Jeff Spurgeon, the Casey Can crew. If you've seen my pit in its 2010 Camaro green uh, skin now, Jeff did yeah. that for me. He did an awesome, awesome job on that. So when you see my pit down the road, thank you the 2010 Camaro because that's what it, the color it's modeled after. My gear pit is um, it's manual. It requires no power. It's, I cook with straight wood. Um, completely opposite ends of the spectrum, honestly. Now, I will tell you this. My goal is to simulate a light smoke the way a pellet cooker cooks on my gear pit, but of course it's not done in, in the same form or fashion in any way. You know, it's it's completely different format. Um, but but there's there's nothing alike about those two, um, in my mind. And are you able to to come by wood fairly easily, or is that kind of like one of those things? <laughs> or if you're going to get into a wood cooker, you really need to have one of those good sources for wood on a continual basis, especially for somebody like you that's doing it quite a bit. Well, I, I think, and I think that's something. No matter what cooker you choose, you need to strongly consider your fuel source before you purchase your pit. You know, if you live in Colorado where there's not a lot of good hardwood to smoke with, I would say a pellet cooker is a pretty damn good choice because you can get it shipped in. You can get pellets shipped in probably easier than any other uh, fuel source. Um, and so I think you see a lot of pellet cookers in Colorado. However, you know, if, if you're in Missouri, if you're in Arkansas, if if you're down in the South, or if you're where there's good solid hickory pecan, good oak, then, then I think your, your choice is you can broaden your horizon a little bit and cook with a stick burner or cook with a combination of charcoal and wood. You know, the Northeast, they've got some pellet cookers up there, but honestly, I think they're predominantly a, a charcoal-style pit, whether it be an egg or a backwoods or a, a, now a stumps up in that area because charcoal's probably the most pre- prevalent uh, fuel sources up in that area. So I think it's regional. I think it, I think it absolutely depends on what you have available to you and how easily you can get your hands on the fuel source. You know, Rod, we talked about this when I had you on for the uh, beef brisket roundtable a little bit, uh, and it's the overall popularity that seems to have come up probably thanks to uh, Myron Mixon and the first season of uh, the Barbecue Pitmasters show, that being that Wagyu beef or that American Kobe beef. Are you still not dabbling around with that at all? I really had hoped that you wouldn't ask me this question because, actually, I had forgotten what I had said during, <laughs> during that uh, show that I couldn't even spell Wagyu. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh, a friend of mine gave me a brisket, a Wagyu brisket, and actually had spelled it on there three times. The first two times, you misspelled it and crossed them out. And I cooked that, and it was a pretty great brisket. And uh, 
The problem I'm having this year, Greg, is it's really difficult to find large briskets. And if you if you dial back to that show, you realize that I like to cook a big, big brisket, and I'm having a lot of trouble finding those. So based on some, some gentle nudging by a couple of my good friends, I have delved into the Snake River Farms uh, Wagyu stuff here recently. Um, Kim Wineski has been helping me quite a bit, and uh, so I have been cooking some Wagyu stuff. Now, I've heard from some pretty credible sources there on the competition circuit that use the, the Snake River Farm briskets that they're a little bit on the smallish side. Are you not having the same issues? Well, I haven't so far. Now, now granted, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm only about six briskets into her, uh, maybe eight, um, but everything's been great size so far. For me. So if you order so if you order two briskets, you're going to be amazed at my knowledge here for a second here, Rod. But if you order two briskets, you get them shipped to you. You're in 168 bucks for two briskets, uh, including the shipping, of course. So to some people it's out outrageous, there, outrageous, isn't it? I know. I mean, to some people, are like, holy crap! I mean, that's a lot of money. Plus, I'm going I'm in with entry fees. I'm one of those people. In your uh, limited experience now with these, is it worth the investment, or can you obviously still win without it? I still believe that good food is good food, and I don't know that we have to have that quality of meat. I will tell you that I've been successful with it. I will tell you I've only won brisket twice this year, and one of those two times was with with a Snake River Farmers product. I think I'm still trying to um, to get it all figured out in terms of cooking that product. I know some other guys. In fact, the truth is. I think it would hurt your head to know how many people are ordering those kind of a brisk, those kinds of briskets, <laughs> and cooking them in competition. Um, so, do I do I believe in it? I believe in the I believe that Snake River Farms or any of those Wagyu guys have really great quality meat, and I believe that uh, you start with a good product, you finish with a good product. Uh, am I 100 percent sold that you have to have that product? I really can't answer that today. So what? 2000, 2001. People were hardly injecting anything. You fast forward to five, six years, everybody's injecting everything on earth. And then the new trend is now this uh, Kobe American or Wagyu uh, beef. Is it a trend? Will it die off in a year or two? Or is it something that potentially has legs to stay on for a long time? That's a really great question. I don't really know the answer to it. I really thought, and my answer to that is this, you know, um, heritage breed pork has been around for probably five or six or seven years and it it tried to gain some popularity uh, along those times and i really thought that eventually we'd be looking at paying a bunch of money for some berkshire or some sort of heritage breed pork and that's never happened <laughs> so I, I don't know i don't know if this is a fad um spawned by the first season of Pitmasters, where you see one of the Pitmasters carrying a big black box on his shoulder or whether this thing will really take legs and pretty much that'll be the standard the way we cook chicken thighs for the most part, in competition. I really can't answer that. Um, I'm as curious about it as you are, for sure. Where uh, will Pellet Envy be competing next? Um, This weekend, we're headed down to Springdale, Arkansas, to compete in a Ronnie Kate Smoke on the Water event down there uh, at the Naturals Ballpark in that area. So um, that's where we're headed this weekend. And I do want to say while I have you, I'm I'm trying to, to create a grassroots following for a new day I'm establishing called Bring your brisket to work in your pants day um, <laughs> to see if I can't get that worked out for sometime in the fall. Are uh, you setting up a website like uh, bigmeatpants.com or something like that? <laughs> you're, you're giving it away, Greg. How did you know? How did you know that without me telling you? See, I'm a master marketer. Uh, the uh, Smoke on the Water event, is that the one that you have? Is that the one you've won twice in a row? Um, this is a new one. This is the first year event. It's in Ronnie's series of events. You know, Ronnie Cates um, has a little promotion going on where he's got a little team of the year race within a, within a race going on. So we're in the lead in that. Um, there's a little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow should we be lucky enough to make it all the way. And so we're just kind of sticking with that for this weekend. We'd intended to go down there since he announced it in the spring, so we're going to stick with that. Um, I think he's down a little bit on Team Cout. I think it would be a great chance for somebody to jump in and probably have a really great shot at uh, at least winning back their entry fee because – He's got a lot of money down there, and he's got a little bit sparse on teams. Rod Gray is the pitmaster of Pellet Envy competition team. Again, the website is pelletenvy.com. The Twitter handle, at Pellet Envy, sponsored by uh, Greased Lightning and Easy Grill. Do you want to give their websites, Rod, while I have you on? I would love to. Uh, Greased Lightning is greased-lightning.com, uh, and Easy Grill is simply easygrill.com. And they really uh, work, both right? Both great sponsors, great products. Check them out. Uh, They support barbecue. Help me out and support them.
And Pellet Envy will be in Springdale, Arkansas this coming weekend. Rod, we are 55 minutes in. You held through and brought some great insight. And, of course, I always appreciate the honesty and the candor. Good luck this weekend. You have the karma, so certainly no surprise if you happen to win, as it uh, has held true for uh, many, many teams uh, over many weeks this year. Uh, Continue success, and uh, we'll look forward to the next conversation. Greg, thank you very much for having me. I love your show. I don't get to listen to it as often as I want to. I did get to listen to it tonight, and honestly, I had really intended on bringing some heat, but uh, you beat me to it with your opening <laughs> remarks about Pickmasters. Kind of set me back on my heels, and I was a little less confident than I thought I would be because you were strong, buddy. But a <laughs> uh, great show. Love what you're doing for barbecue. Keep it up, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much for having me on. All right, take care, Rock. There he is. Pickmaster, pellet envy, baby. Pelletenvy.com. That's the website. So, I mean, like uh, only a billion things you could possibly react to uh, from what uh, Rod Gray has had said tonight. So we'll look forward to your email reaction here uh, over the course of the week before next show. And uh, I didn't know personally that uh, Rod was selected to be on this coming season. And again, I still wonder where that line of delineation is for teams that put in, got in some really good demo tapes and we're told about that whole change in format. And did anybody pull out? That's, you know, contracts are always going to be contracts. And you're either going to be able to negotiate them or the people that have the show that are pushing the contracts are going to kind of say what Rod said. They said, you sign it or piss. And you're either going to sign or you're going to piss off. And so Rod decided to piss off, which is certainly his prerogative. Given the format, given my dislike for the new format and the weird keeping of the name but the true supporting of everybody that is in that show because those are barbecue people and I support everything that has to do with barbecue and unabashedly not making any excuses I will watch the remaining episodes but that doesn't mean I like the show format because I'm just not a fan of that format and it is not a depiction of what is happening out there weekend in and weekend out and none of those people are going to sit there and tell you that they're not they're not going to sit there and say What we do on the show is exactly what we do weekend in and weekend out. And here's some crown roast pork to prove it. Catfish and whatever the hell else. That's weird. Not a fan of Art Smith. Anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, Let's go ahead and blow out the prize closet. So if you want to jump in, you're well after 11, well, well after, six minutes after, seven minutes after 11 o'clock. So if you're hanging with me, you enjoyed the conversation, and you want some fruit for your listening labor, call in at 877-448-0433, and uh, we'll get you hooked up. The Cosmos is out, but we do have a frog mat. We do have Santa Maria-style uh, El Capitan rub, and we have the uh, Wild Game rub, and we have Cedar Planks as well. So a uh, veritable cornucopia of prizes to choose from just for listening tonight because I think it's great that you do. Area code 760. Name and where you're calling from. This is Tom out in California. Hey, Tom. How are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm doing great. That was a great interview with Rod. Yeah, Rod, uh, always bringing it strong here for the Barbecue Central Radio Show, and it's always nice to get somebody on, you know, doing well, obviously, out there in the competition scene, but not afraid to really speak the mind, and I certainly appreciate about that. You bet. You bet. So we have some things to give away here. Uh, what would you like? We have a frog mat. We have some El Capitan Santa Maria-style seasoning. We also have some uh, wild game rub or some cedar planks from the good folks over at BBQ Hooks. Cedar planks. Sounds like that. Sounds like fun. All right, go ahead and shoot me your shipping info, greg at the bbqcentralshow.com. Got it, buddy. All right, thanks for calling in tonight. Awesome. Now we'll go to area code 585, naming where you're calling from. Uh, I'm in New York. I'm sorry? Albany, New York. Albany, New York. Uh, Name, please. Noel. Albion. Uh, A-L-B-I-O-N. Gotcha. Noel, how are you tonight, buddy? Good, good. All right, no. Hey, uh, Rod found a really great end of the show tonight. He uh, really got into stuff. Yeah, Rod, uh, certainly not afraid to uh, share the opinions, and uh, that's what we appreciate here on the show. Uh, we have some things to give away here. We have a wild game rub from uh, the good folks over at bbqhooks.com. We also have some El Capitan Santa Maria style seasoning, which is one of my all time favorites. We also have a uh, frog mat to give away as well. Which uh, one would you like, No? I'd like to try the frog mat, please. 
All right, so this is what you need to do, uh, Noel, because these are custom cut to your cooker. Send me the grill grate size uh, that you have and uh, make sure that it's uh, not a, an actual uh, like direct grilling heat source. It needs to be indirect, otherwise it could melt on you. So as long as you got an indirect cooker or a heat shield a deflector of some sort, like a water pan or whatever, just send me that grate size. And uh, Mike and the good guys over at Frogmats will get you hooked up. Okay, great. Thank you very much, sir. All right, thanks for calling in tonight, Noel. Appreciate it. There he is. No calling in from New York. You know, the show's really big up in the Northeast. No, you should go to uh, Taste of the Deerfield Valley, 5th Annual, CelebrateTheValley.com. 150 bucks. You can hang out with Myron Mix. Pick his brain about Wagyu brisket. Wagyu br- Rod Gray sat there telling I wouldn't use Wagyu brisket. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Snake River Farms is uh, like the monopoly of Wagyu brisket, I think. Area code 816, name and where you're calling from. I'm calling from Kansas City, Missouri. And your name, sir? Tyler. How you doing tonight, Tyler? I'm doing great. How you doing? Oh, man. Doing great. I've never uh, I've actually pulled two hours tonight, two hours and ten minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, so we have uh, thoughts about tonight's show, Tyler, first. Go ahead. Share it with the Central Lights. I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the honesty and frankness of that guy. He's great. It's nice to see somebody that's really kind of riding the wave of success, uh, especially in the competition side of things, uh, not afraid to come on and share his points of view about pretty much everything the state of competition barbecue is in right now. Yeah, I, I totally concur. I, I think the, the guy just hits everything on the head, and uh, he uh, thankfully for the – Think of your radio show. He doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't pull out the uh, he doesn't pull the stop. He pulls out all the stops on this thing. You know, I, I love the fact that he's honest about everything. Yeah, nice to have uh, you know, to the point where it stings. You know. Yeah, it's nice to have people not not afraid to, to share the opinion and, and not be politically correct because I appreciate that uh, first and foremost. All right, uh, so Tyler, we have uh, two things left to give away. We have some wild game rub from uh, bbqhooks.com, or we also have some El Capitan. Santa Maria style barbecue seasoning. Which one would you like? Uh, dude, you got me. You got me sold on the El Capitan already. I'm telling you, it's gonna be probably if it's not the first, it'll definitely be the second favorite seasoning that you have in your uh, in your cupboard because you can use it obviously on the beef. You know, especially if you have a tri tip fan uh, or any type of London broil or the pit beef or steak or whatever. But man, it is good on vegetables, potatoes, hot dogs, and chili and uh, ice cream. It doesn't matter. Stuff is so good, you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised, and I'll bet I'll be getting an email from you saying how good it actually is when you get your hands on it. So, Tyler, all you need to do is send me your shipping info, greg at the bbqcentralshow.com, and uh, we'll get you hooked up. Greg at bbqcentral.com. The BBQ Central Show. Add show, otherwise it goes nowhere. The bbqcentralshow.com. All right, thanks, bro. All right, Tyler, thanks for calling in tonight. Now I'm fresh out of prizes. Nice. Thanks, everybody, for calling in there at the end of the show. 12 minutes over. Best thing about not being on terrestrial radio. And I can say this because it's 11, 12. Fuck the clock. The good thing about terrestrial radio, you have a producer that can hit the own sound effects buttons for you. You don't sound like an idiot when you decide to swear unabashedly for no good reason. All right, lesson learned. First hour, I want to thank my guest, Mike Wozniak from QWOW, currently number one, KCBS Team of the Year. Robin Medlin, third segment. Grill Girl, sharing tips about tailgating. Bring your grill to work day. Also... The Grill Girl classes, teaching women not to be afraid of that outdoor live fire grilling, baby. Don't be afraid of the meat, ladies. Don't be afraid of the meat. (laughs) Then, of course, uh, this hour, Rod Gray from Pellet Envy. The whole hour, 55 minutes or whatever. Strong from top to bottom. It'll be an all-time for sure. We are loaded again for next week. Programming note, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll put this in uh, post-production on the pre-roll. The show, next week is moving to Wednesdays, is moving to Wednesdays for the next 15 weeks because of a school scheduling conflict that I cannot get out of. So from now on for the next 15 weeks, Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And until then, your program hosts and proud U.S. American Greg Rempe, 
Good night now. <laughs>